You know, when you stop loving God, you start hating humanity. Hello, friends, and welcome. Thanks so much for listening. I really appreciate both of you. You know, if you've been in church much, you've probably heard about the decline of the church. And I just want to go on record and say, I don't believe that's true. In fact, I don't believe that the church has ever been in decline. Do you remember when in the book of Daniel in the Bible, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and he demands that his wise men not only interpret the dream for him, but he makes them tell him what the dream is so that he knows that they're not lying to him. And he says, if you can't tell me what the dream was and interpret it, I'm going to kill you all. And so Daniel, who is in the service of the king, cries out to God and prays and asks God to reveal to him this dream so that he can save the lives of his friend and his own life and all the wise men. And God reveals to Daniel the dream. And Daniel tells King Nebuchadnezzar the dream that when uh, it's Daniel chapter 2, he says, you looked and there before you stood a large statue, dazzling, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. And while you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken into pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. And so Daniel goes on to interpret this, and he says, uh, you are the head of gold, then after you there's going to be another kingdom inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things into pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. And just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly baked of clay and partly of iron, this will be a divided kingdom, yet will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this king kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not be, remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. And then he says, uh, In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. And so there's some controversy uh, among Christian theologians about how to interpret the different kingdoms that are highlighted in this dream, but the controversy is really only about one part. And so everyone agrees that the head of gold is Babylon, the statue of silver is Persia, the brass part is uh, the Greek empire, then the legs of iron are the Roman empire, then when you get to the feet, the iron mixed with clay, then theologians start to diverge. And some would say that was the divided Roman empire, and it was during that time that uh, the Messiah came to the earth and God began to set up his kingdom. And some people say, no, that's the time that we're living in today uh, when people are mixing with one another and there are all these different nation states. And uh, now is the time when God is expanding his kingdom. But regardless of you know what you think about the interpretation on the, the timeline, the reality remains that there is a kingdom that God began to establish at the advent of, of Jesus Christ, and it will never decrease. Isaiah, in chapter 9, the verses that are familiar to all of us if we've ever been to a Christmas service from Handel's Messiah, but in Isaiah chapter 9, it says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace." Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. 
the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And so I don't believe in the decline of the church. You know, I think man can set up institutions and institutions have life cycles and they, they're formed and they grow and they, you know, there's been plenty of study on the life cycle of, a, of an institution or a business, but God's church is ever expanding, ever increasing. And in fact, I believe that the church uh, has never had a season where it has shrunk. I just, I just don't think that's true. I think when you look at how the gospel has expanded all over the world, the church has just been growing and growing and growing. And sometimes we may not see it, we may not experience it. And if we're not, we should uh, get where we can experience it. We should look for those places where God is at work and it is expanding and we can be part of it. And we should become catalysts of kingdom expansion. If we're not seeing the kingdom expand, (laughs) the problem is uh, us. We need to look no further than ourselves and we need to see the kingdom expand around us. We need to be the agents that bring kingdom expansion. And sometimes that expansion comes at the cost of suffering. And that may be one reason that we don't see uh, the church expanding around us is that we're not willing to suffer. And we just want to, you know, be quiet. Uh, the, The society will leave us alone if we just go into our churches and have our religious services. There's no persecution. No one Uh, We'll give you a hard time for that. But if you begin to preach the gospel, if you begin to tell people the only way to be saved is to call on the name of Jesus, the only path of salvation is to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus, well, that'll make some people mad, and then you'll be persecuted, and it's uncomfortable. We don't like that. And so um, sometimes uh, that's the reason why we don't see the kingdom expand around us, is we're just fearful of the rejection that comes with preaching the gospel. But I pray that God would give us good courage and and make us be a people of boldness and grace and love, that we have enough love for the people around us that we're willing to speak the gospel out wherever we go and to our neighbors and uh, to our uh, co-workers and uh, classmates and different people all around us that uh, God might make us salt and light wherever we are planted. And 1 John 5, 19 says that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So we don't need to be shocked. Uh, The world hated Jesus. The world's going to hate us. You know, when you stop loving God, you start hating humanity. When people stop loving God, they start hating humanity because the love of people is rooted in the love of God. People are valuable because they bear God's image. And I don't mean that non-Christians, you know, hate their own children. Uh, There's enough uh, of the image of God preserved in each of us that we still love our own family and friends, but we don't value other people's lives. I lived in a communist country um, for more than a decade, and there's not the value of life that there is in countries that are built on Judeo-Christian values, that where God is not honored, where people don't love God, where there's no foundation of humans as valuable because they bear the image of God, uh, that basically means humans aren't valuable. And so if you're not powerful, if you're not rich, if you don't contribute anything to the society, then you're really a burden and it's not so bad if you're not around. And so when people stop loving God, they start hating other people. And we see that in all of the godless philosophies where people want to, uh, you know, get rid of human beings to save the dogs and the cats and the whales and uh, the penguins and whatever, polar bears and all that stuff. Or people want, uh, people say that it's a good thing to kill babies and having large families, having lots of kids, that's a bad thing. That is a, as a demonic thought as there ever was and as backwards as it could ever get. I've told the story before, but we had friends who got pregnant with their fifth child, and uh, all of the relatives around them who were not Christians, who were not followers of God, all said that this is horrible. They were all angry at them and told them, you must get an abortion. And when they told us, we just rejoiced with them. We said, congratulations, that's awesome. And they were so shocked by our reaction. They thought that we were going to scold them too. And we said, no, that's fantastic. You know, praise God. This child is is a gift from God. This child bears the image of God. And they just realized in that moment how backward the world was, that the world was uh, telling them that to be pregnant and to have a lot of children, that that was bad, and to kill babies, that that was a good thing. And and the world is just so backwards. 
Uh, we must not listen to the world. We must not uh, let our, our thinking be corrupted. We must not be darkened in our understanding as the scripture talks about it. In Romans chapter 1, it says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. So there's a a progression there that people can see when you look at the vastness of the universe, when you look at the incredible design in the human body and in DNA, you can know that there's an author of life. You can know there's a creator. But people turn away from that very uh, evident piece of knowledge that's available to everyone. That that part of God's revelation is common to everyone. And, and people turn away from that small revelation and they deny that and they don't honor God. They don't give him thanks. Then they become futile and they're thinking then their foolish hearts are darkened. And so we don't want to let people whose foolish hearts are darkened be the ones who tell us what is right and what is wrong. We want to be informed by the revelation of God that is preserved for us in the Word, that is revealed to us through the Holy Spirit, and we want to be led by God. Paul talks about the same idea in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 17. He says, Now I say this in testifying the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become calloused and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But That is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So Paul says we have to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. We have to change the way we think. We have to receive the revelation that comes to us through God's Son, Jesus Christ, through the illumination of the Holy Spirit. And then we're not conformed, like Romans 12 says, be, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And so we get transformed as we renew our mind and we start to think the way God thinks and we realize, you know what? Pets are not children. It's, it's really pathetic when Christians follow the world and talking about their pets like they're their children. And uh, I know that hurts some people's feelings, but it's it's ridiculous. We have to wake up to some truth here, and um, we have to just be like, you know, that's a dog, and it doesn't bear God's image, and it's really not that important. And it's so wild to think how offensive that would be to so many people, even believers, even Christians. And it's because we have allowed our thinking to be conformed to this world where people want to say that animals are just as valuable as human beings. And, you know, people want to talk about their their animals like their their children because, um, you know, they don't want to have children anymore. And, and now I'll let these animals replace my children. We don't have any kids, but, you know, we have our, our, our dogs are our kids. And it's like, well, no, your dogs are your dogs. So anyway, uh, praise the Lord. We want to speak the truth in love. You know, I don't want to be offensive for the sake of being offensive, but the church is a bulwark of the truth. It's uh, the church's duty and uh, privilege is to stand up to the lies of the world and to know that when we do so, the world hates us. Uh, but there will be the ones that God is calling to himself that will be drawn out to the truth. There will be the ones who will come to the light when the church takes a stand for what's right. And so as uncomfortable as it may be, that's what we have to do in our communities. May God give us grace and strength to be that witness and to be the lovers of God and the true lovers of humanity as we serve our neighbors, as we love them, as we perform acts of service and humility. We're willing to wash their feet. We're willing to pick up the garbage. We're willing to uh, scrub the toilets and do whatever it takes to uh, reflect the nature of our King, our Messiah King, who became the servant of all humanity, that we would uh, consider others better than ourselves and have that same mindset that Jesus Christ had and also while doing so that we would be faithful to speak the truth in Jesus Christ so that the ones God is calling to himself might be saved. Thanks so much for listening. God bless you. God make you courageous in your proclamation. Pray for me too that I might be bold in proclaiming the gospel wherever I go.